ever since North America started to bomb out of group stage, there's been one number that you've heard repeated a lot lately across uh, Twitter, Reddit, elsewhere. That number is 400,000. Yes, that's right. The average pro player in the LCS is paid $400,000 a year, and many people think that that is too much. Is it? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Actually, it's tonight because it's 3 a.m. and I'm still on the Nocturnal World schedule. Uh, but of course, this video is brought to you by Alienware. So, should pro players be paid this much? Are pro players in the LCS overpaid? My answer is yes. Kind of. Uh, and... And it's yes for the reasons that you don't you don't think it is. So I disagree, first off, with what everybody says when they say pro players are paid too much in the LCS for the performance that we see at international events. This is kind of this thing that people keep trying to throw around. They start comparing LCS pro players to other pro players, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the thing. Uh, when you say that, it assumes that there is a number that you think that these pro players should be paid. And so if you have this opinion, I would ask you right now to go through in your mind and come up with the number that you think is appropriate for them and then try to justify it. The fact of the matter is, is that there's no real way to do some sort of mathematical equation, especially as sort of the average person outside of the LCS to determine what a player should be paid based off of their performance. Uh, is 300 somehow better if we don't make it out of groups? It's going to need to be 600 if we make it to semifinals. You see sort of the flaw in this reasoning. There's no number that's associated with what a player's performance needs to look like at an international event. So then why do I think pro players are overpaid in the LCS? Well, let's get into it. So first off, let's go back several years. I actually did a video way back when saying that players' salaries should be public. Um, at the time, there were basically no agents and franchising was not a thing yet. And I actually did feel as though many pro players were being underpaid relative to the value that they were bringing their organizations and in many cases, the sponsors that these organizations were able to, to get. I actually kind of felt like they were getting ripped off in some cases. And then what ended up happening is uh, a couple different things. One, teams went to franchising um, and they started to be able to invest a lot more into their players in part because they could raise more money because now they had this, this single thing, which was a slot in the LCS that everyone knew was valued at least, you know, upwards of 10 million because that's what Riot charged teams to get in. And it was a process. So if you're in and nobody else is in, you have this thing that is at least worth 10 million. You can raise against that and people know that you have this thing. You're also not going to get relegated, right? So you know, in the past times where orgs would invest a ton of money into these challenger teams or these academy teams, whatever, and then they would get into the LCS, play six months or less, and then get relegated, whatever. So this allowed orgs to start raising a lot more money and to start investing into rosters and thinking long-term. I know there's some debate about whether or not how, you know, how long-term some of these orgs do think, but that's basically what allowed uh, salaries to go up as well as agents, because what ended up happening too is more and more every year pro players have been signing up with agents who are representing them now in a lot of cases i don't think that these agents are necessarily particularly good i do think they've gotten better over time but one thing that they did allow um, was for somebody who has at least some knowledge and savviness to go and argue with team owners about what a player should be able to make so they ended up starting to make a ton more and so what has happened over time is that you have seen annually the average pro player salary increased dramatically. Now, uh, so now we're at a point where I don't think that most pro, pro players are underpaid. I'm sure there are some on the lower end that should make more, but that's kind of my point actually as well, is that it's important for everyone to remember that 400K is the average. There are teams in the LCS whose total salary amount is around 1 million or less. So consider that when you throw out the 400K number, that just because you see a pro player competing in the LCS, it does not mean that they are making 400K. So at the same time, what we've also seen is a lot of these teams start to be able to court a ton of sponsors, right? Like if you look at Team Liquid, if you look at Cloud9, they have a pretty long list of sponsors. And in a lot of cases, these are uh, pretty big name brands, right? Uh, Honda is a pretty good example of that. I mean, obviously Alienware. Um, 
AT and T, uh, Microsoft, etc. You you can see a lot of these really big name brands. And while I don't necessarily think that all of them are spending a tremendous amount of money, we are in a very different state uh, financially than we were even just three or four years ago in the LCS. And so it makes sense that pro player salaries have gone up over time to match this. The other really, really, really important thing that everyone should remember is that, technically speaking, the only player in the LCS that has equity in their team is Bjergsen. And that was done with this really big deal. Everybody knows about this from like basically a year ago. And uh, so all these other players don't have equity. So what happens when teams start being able to, to create $35 million facilities, $50 million facilities, another $50 million facility, and they're raising money in order to do this. And so the value of their company is going up tremendously over time. And in some cases, we don't know, but like it's pretty clear that some of these uh, owners are probably able to take some money during these raises as well. So consider the fact that in many cases, you have certain players that have been participating in the LCS ecosystem, have been playing for these organizations that have uh, raised considerable funds who have sold in some cases, right? Like think about CLG to Madison Square Garden. And if you played on these teams and you were a part of the success that was able to increase their valuation and increase what their worth, um, you probably saw very little money from any of that, right? You know, think about a tech company, right? Uh, a lot of you might be familiar with the concept of a tech company startup where you have a ton of people, usually fairly young, that go in and just grind day after day after day, deal with a ton of stress, deal with a ton of issues, et cetera. They don't know if they're ever gonna make a ton of money. Their salaries are not necessarily particularly high, but guess what? They're getting equity in this company so that if they end up, the company ends up selling, like for instance, how Riot did to Tencent forever ago. <laughs> Let's put it this way. When Riot sold to Tencent, many of the people that I'd known for a long time suddenly paid off all their college debt, purchased homes, bought you know, really fancy cars, it's the benefit of working at one of these tech companies or video game companies, whatever, is that if you're you're at the startup, they sell, you get this big payday. Well, guess what? Pro players are not getting that. Um, they did not before and they aren't doing it now because they cannot have this equity. So what you need to be able to do is compensate these players, these individuals in some other way, right? And that basically comes in the form of cash. Uh, they're paying out pretty big salaries every year. And as I said, those have gone up. So that's kind of what you're seeing here. And that's why it makes sense that these pro players are making so much money right now is because they are actually doing so much. They are so valuable to these orgs in terms of being able to increase their value. Could get, guess what? Like think about how much money TSM is able to say that they are worth to investors because of the amount of times that they have won LCS spring and summer and how many times they've gone to worlds. Think about that with cloud nine, right? You can, all these orgs can make different arguments, especially the top ones about why they are the most successful organization of all time, right? Like TSM can go say, hey, we did, we're the best because we've won all these trophies and we've got Bjergsen, who's this historic player. Now we've got Double Lift. Cloud9 can say, look, we've done better internationally than any other team has before. And, you know, so players like, I don't know, Sneaky, Licorice, et cetera, these players that have allowed them to do this have participated in increasing the values of these teams is important that they are compensated accordingly. Okay, so then you're sitting here and you're saying, Travis, you said that pro players are overpaid, but you told me that it's not because of their international performance and you made a bunch of reasons for why they should be able to get all this cash. Well, here's where things get kind of wonky. Pro player salaries are really, really high compared to how much money these teams actually make. Think about the fact that if you have a couple different teams or players on your team who are getting paid a million dollars or you're paying millions of dollars for buyouts, you're spending all this money on players. Think about how much money you then need to pay or to get in from sponsors in order to, to do this. We know from what Riot has said that the LCS does not run profitably right now. So the revenue shares to the teams, like not particularly significant. And again, they're making their own money from their sponsors or whatever, but like these teams on the whole are losing money. And the reason they're doing this is because they think that at some point in time, uh, they're all going to be making tons and tons of money, right? Like their businesses will be worth way more because this is what happened in traditional sports. And that's what they're selling these investors on this dream of you give me a million dollars now so that later on I can give you 10 million back or something. What I'm really getting here is if a team is saying that they are worth a hundred million dollars or that they are a team worthy of 
building out a $50 million training facility, you really have to say at that point in time, okay, well then this pro player probably deserves $400,000 based off of the success that they are able to bring to this organization, or even if it's not the success, their ability to compete in the LCS, which is the most valuable product any of these orgs have. However, I question whether or not teams should be building $50 million training facilities. I question the numbers at which they are able to raise. And once you start to do that, you have to start wondering if they should be spending as much money as they are, not just on training facilities, but on pro player salaries. So that is what I'm getting at. I actually, I do think that we'll see salaries start to go down because I think some orgs will realize that, hey, we're not making as much money as we thought we were going to three years ago. And hey, it is getting harder and harder to raise money. You know, the, the orgs that have sports teams behind them have probably taken pretty significant financial hits this year because sporting has been difficult. And the ones that have uh, investors that are funding them might find it's hard to get some of that investor money whenever it seems like the economy is in, at the very least, a shaky state compared to two to three years ago. And so, yeah, I do think we'll start to see pros make less money. I don't think it's because they aren't getting us further than groups. I don't think that even if we made it to semifinals or finals, that suddenly the LCS would be raising way more money and all these teams would be worth way more. So that's kind of where we're at. So yes, overpaid. No, not because of international performance. It's a lot more complicated than that. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Thanks so much to Alienware for sponsoring it. And uh, I don't know, feel free to sub because I'd love to get more subs. All I've got going for me now. Hello. I don't know what time it is. Did I just wake up or am I about to go to sleep? It's uh, the middle of the night here. But guess what? In Shanghai, it's the middle of the day. And so that's, that's what I'm thinking about right now. As well as Alienware.com slash Travis. You could save 10% off your order with Travis 10 off Q3. There's a link in the video description below. And that code is there as well. Get ready also for us to catapult into Q4 with Travis Tenoff Q4. That's the code that's going to be available soon. Listen, they make amazing stuff. I've told you about this before. And they make it so that I can cover worlds. Because I would not... Let's be honest. I would not... NA's out. Alright? I would not be doing this if... Uh, if I did not have somebody who I literally owe a contractual debt to... <laughs> Thank you so much to Alienware. You can also check out Draft Buff uh, in the description below. Both of them help it coming through to sponsor our world's coverage. I'm going to go sleep. <laughs>